This is Larry Hedrick for Mysteries of Superstition Mountains, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today we have another great story by Jack San Felice. Uh, Bob Ward, um, he came here in um, this area in about 1958, because things about Bob Ward are, are shadowy. And what you can't believe what you read sometimes. You think you got it right, you know. And anyhow, he was here for sure in the 60s and 70s because of the people that uh, he had talked to and the information I had found. Why Bob Ward, I think, got so interested in the superstitions. Not long after um, World War II and Korean War, he had been in the Korean War and he came out here. And there was a lot of people out here, so-called prospectors, out of jobs. After World War II, a lot of men were out, out of jobs and in the Korean War about the same thing. And they were looking for, a lot of them were looking for adventure. And they read about articles that would put in the newspaper about the Superstition Mountains, gold here. These stories started coming out and they didn't quit. The stories of Adolf Ruth came out in the 1930s, and then Barry Storm's book come out, and the stories of Bob Garman about the about Peraltas. By the way, Bob Garman was very good friends with, with uh, Bob Ward. In fact, he dedicated a page to Bob Ward in his book. Bob Ward's book, after, he didn't write his book until after he was, uh, he'd been through the superstition about 30 years and he wrote it um, as he was dying of cancer. So the, you got to take this book with what he wrote in the newspaper articles. He wrote several very good newspaper articles. He made friends with a lot of people um, and, and he was a researcher. And seeing as he was, a, he was a researcher and he worked for the newspapers, and he eventually worked for the Apache Sentinel, and they kept binders, great big binders of all their newspaper articles that they had written as the Apache Sentinel. And he could go back through those, and he had a, they were available to him, and so he started gathering this information about the lost Dutchman story and about the Peraltas, and he was trying to put the two together. He was fascinated by the Peralta Stone legend. Peralta Stones became a notoriety mm, starting about 1948 or 49 when they allegedly were found. He spent 30 years trying to put this story together on the Dutchman and tried to find and verify the fact that the Peraltas were actually were here and that he could find one of the mines. That was his goal. He wrote under the name of Bell Paris. Well, Val Paris was a derivative of the word Valparaiso, which means a place of treasure, golden treasure, Valparaiso. Everybody's dream is to find a, a Valparaiso. So he took the nom de plume, Val Paris, when he wrote, and that's the name that's on his, all of his newspaper articles, Val Paris, not Bob Ward. Bob Ward stated in his newspaper articles and in his book that the reason you can't find the Peralta's treasure is that any of the maps or stories, the language is not the language that was used back then. The signs and the symbols that they used were different than the language of today. Bob wrote, wrote this story in the Apache Sentinel, and it was called Tracking the Ancient Peraltas with a Stone Map. He wanted to believe the stone maps. He really thought that they were real. First off, you have a story about some people who may or may not be real. And they, and then you have people that are totally dedicated to that story. And then by the same token, you go on the other side. There are those that don't believe the story at all and they believe the stones were fake. Bob Ward found some areas that in the, around the south, southern foothills of the superstitions, and he used that story in his book as well as in his newspaper articles in tracking the Peraltas with the stone map. 
So in, in there, he, he found a knife uh, that had been etched into uh, a rock, and, and he found some other marks, and he actually dug in solid rock out there in a place called Knife Rock, Knife Hill. And, and I, it's amazing that, that he would have actually dug in solid rock looking for the treasure. Well, in, in 1998, I found um, several treasure signs while I was searching that area, or, or, or could have been treasure signs, of Knife Hill and Knife Rock, along with in fact, some petroglyphs and ancient Indian rock writing. But it's an interesting story because just before you get to Knife Rock, there was a large boulder set right down from the bottom base of the hill. And it was, it had like a, the one end was like, had like a pointer on it and like a pencil sharpened to a point. And on there, there were some etched in the stone. There were uh, some saguaros. And they looked like they were marked up saguaros. And then on the other side, there was the name El Gato, 41, the cat. Now, El Gato in the mountains, and, and Bob Ward talks about El Gato and finding this, uh, this name. In my search of over 25 years, 30 years, I found El Gato's name all the way down to the Hill River north all the way into the superstitions, into the uh, the Peralta, what they call the Peralta Caves up there, off uh, near near the Mesa, you know which Mesa I'm talking about. I uh, just Peter's Mesa, on the trail to Peter's Mesa. There inside the cave, there's a name El Gato, and I find I it was on uh, uh, some petroglyphs on a knoll just south of Route 60, directly in line with uh, Black Point North and Knife Rock. Uh, the, the one other thing about Knife Rock in that area is, beside the Pointer Rock, and there is a, uh, set in the desert, there's a series of stones that are in a straight line off for a few hundred yards. There used to be more of them, but the, the campers are starting to take them and make fire pits out of them. But they used to go longer, a longer way, and they, and they go right exactly to Knife Rock. Uh, I thought that was kind of uh, curious that somebody either would spend all that time putting these stones together and to make this, this, uh, Lead you right to Knife Rock and Knife Hill. I climbed all over those mount, that mountain. I didn't find any anything that looked like gold. Hard to find quartz, hard to find anything. Now, Bob Ward also wrote about a fellow by the name of um, what would Polka, an Indian an Indian friend of his. Well, well, Bob Ward was in the, the army and met this. Apache Indian named Polka, A.J. Polka, and he had a treasure map, he said, from, <laughs> we've all got treasure maps, I've got 150 of them, but uh, uh, he said this treasure will lead you to this large mountain, and he scratched out a map for him, boy, but I'll tell you what, there's no way anybody could find anything, and even, I, I, I don't know, that's, I think, when Bob was getting uh, a little bit, uh, you know, trying to make a story where none existed. But then he writes this, this uh, story in two uh, newspapers, and this is the Apache Sentinel, and then he writes it in a, in a place called the Arizona Gazette. But he says, maybe I found the Lost Dutchman mine. He said he found an old mine after he found the large mountain, and then he went down into the valley, he found, he found a mine that was uh, brushed over. 
that some of the stack brush and, and some uh, larger pieces of trees over to like hide it. He pulled that aside and there was a shaft there, and but the ladders were all rotten. He didn't go down. Now, Bob said he, he was in his, in his book and then in the article, he said that he looked over around to see if he could find remains of the camp of Ehlers Camp, see if it was a good story. There, there was uh, some junk left around there, but he did find a rotted bag, which was Bull Durham tobacco bag. And inside there, there were some gold nuggets. Bob had them assayed and they said they were gold, but their, the gold content was like $4 a ton. At the time, um, Gold was $35 a ton. So I, I don't think it was worth it to even follow that story through. For $4 a ton, that's not much. That would, that would You'd have to work pretty hard uh, to get enough gold to make it worthwhile. Uh, the one thing brings us back to the Knife Rock area. He said that the uh, you go a little bit further and there's this black top mountain there, or black mountain, which somebody named on the map North Black Point. And some people refer to that as Borrego Mountain in conjunction with the Adolf Ruth story, because at one time he had searched in an area called Borrego in the Borrego Desert of California. And anyhow, and when you go up through that mountain, that little mountain on the east side of it, there are all of these grind holes. I mean, and they are huge. They, some about that big around, a lot of them about that big around, and they go down some uh, about a foot or so. And Bob stated that he believed that that's where the Peraltas that took the gold out of the mountains used that, those holes to grind up the ore so then they could pack it on in packs like burlap sacks on the backs of mules to take them to Mexico. And he said that's where the that's where the um, the battle started with the Apaches, when the Apaches attacked the so-called Peralta miners, and then they chased them through the superstitions, and they finally wound up on the west end of Superstition Mountain, the northwest end, in an area on the map today called the Massacre Grounds, and that story is also told in depth. Um, and the map's given in depth in Garman's book, Mystery Gold of the Superstitions. Seeing that map in both Garman's book and Ward writing about it, and writing about the same thing, he, he didn't put the map in his book, but he wrote about it, and he told exactly the same direction, the same story that Garman wrote. And so I said, I gotta see if I can do this. So yeah, I, in my hiking, I, I hiked, uh, from that area to Peralta, and then from Peralta up the Peralta Trail, and then through, and you can go all the way through the mountains, and when you come out, you come to um, the northwest side. And, but that, that hike is about 25 miles. The way you go there, it's about 25 miles, because you're not a straight line anywhere. And, but, but, both Garmin and Ward said that that was a three-day fight, and then that makes sense that they, in three days, they could have gone through the mountains and wind up there. Why they would want to fight there and go through the mountains back to where they started maybe gathering the gold, because that place was right across from gold fields, the gold field mines, and there's uh, there is a an old Spanish drift that they found over there. So there's some, there's some common sense in the fact that the, some gold was taken from a place where there was gold. And in fact, uh, on the massacre grounds, there is a story about two old prospectors finding some gold there in the rotted sacks. That part of the story now of searching all of this and talking about Bob Ward leads me to, of course, reading Bob Ward's book a little bit more, and then I find what's Bob Ward's cabin, 
We have Bob Ward's book. You have his stories. Somewhere around there, if you can, might still be able to find Bob Ward's book. And if you put these two books together and start searching, you'll find a real mystery of the superstition. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.